So I, I want to start off with this quote that um, inspired me a few weeks ago, and it says, uh, what you eat today walks and talks tomorrow. And it got me thinking. I was like, wow, what I do today, what I think today, walks and talks tomorrow. It makes me think, okay, then I better be careful what I do today because it walks and talks tomorrow. And so um, a few weeks ago in the little Tucson coffee news, you know, you see those in several stores. Um, well, I picked one up and I was reading about the leatherwood bees. I didn't know that honey could taste very different depending on what the bees actually feed on. So some, some of the uh, honey that you taste can um, taste floral, tangy, or woody. Okay, but there's this leatherwood honey that's really special because it comes from bees who feed on a tree that has to grow, um, it has to be 70 to 75 years old before it produces the blossoms that the bees feed on. And so it's very, um, it's, it's rare, and um, there's people who will come in with helicopters to get the bee from the hives, and there's some people that will um, camp out waiting for the season to get this honey, but it's special honey. And what stood out to me in this article was, was when it said that these bees have to feed on this, these blossoms to produce a certain type of taste. And so what we eat walks and talks tomorrow. What we eat changes what we produce, right? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I want the bees that um, feed on jelly donuts or just donuts in general. I want those bees. Um, but whatever we're eating, okay, today with, with our mind, with our thoughts, with our actions, we walk and talk tomorrow. All right? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What defines you? What is the essence of you? It's not one action, and it's not one thought, but it is an accumulation of your thoughts. It's really what you're thinking. If you think angry thoughts all the time, you, your character could be defined as an angry person. If you think hypercritical thoughts all the time, you could be defined as a hypercritical person. If you think positive thoughts all the time, you can be, your character can be described as a positive person. Or if you worry all the time, you worry uh, when you're sick, you, when you're healthy, you worry about getting sick, then you can, your character can be described as someone who worries. But it's for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's what is in the inside of you that you think about and hold on to and keep thinking that really defines your essence, who you are, all right, in your character. Jesus taught that before we commit an action, there is a thought, right? He talked about how before someone commits murder, there was a thought called hatred that we grabbed onto and we let it grow, and it turned into an action called murder. But it started with a thought. Jesus said, uh, before there's the action of adultery, okay, that affair, there was a thought called lust that you grabbed onto and let it grow, and then it turned into an action. So Jesus is telling us that if you want to know where the battle is really fought, it's in your mind, in your heart, in your thoughts. That's where we have to get the root of the problem uh, resolved there before it turns into the action. All right. Um, I'm, this message has been helpful to me because um, I want some different results in my life. And I'm pretty sure there are people here that want different results in your life, whether it's um, you want different results mentally or spiritually or uh, with your health. And it has to go back to your thinking. There was a woman who was bleeding for 12 years, and she spent all her money on doctors. And so she kept doing the same thing over and over, but getting the exact same results but she heard about a guy named Jesus who could heal people. And she went to Jesus and thought, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I could be healed. And that's what she does. And power goes out of Jesus and she's healed. But notice she does something different. Instead of spending this, the, the, uh, you know, going to the doctors for 12 years, she 
did something different. She went to Jesus. She changed her routine, and she got different results. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of me and my yearly Bible reading in years past. Okay, In years past, I would start off the year reading my Bible, and I was so good at just you know getting it done. But then day two of the year would come about, <laughs> and I'd start to get behind. And um, so... I had to change my thinking and going into this year i thought you know what this idea of i can read the bible all by myself in a year and i don't need any extra help might not be true um i think i might need someone to hold me accountable i think i might need someone to encourage me and help me up when i start to get behind and so um going into this year i knew that derby um sitting in the back over there i knew that he had read his bible um every year for about eight to nine years in a row so i'm like i think he could help me because he does that right and so i asked him if he would hold me accountable and that has that has helped me tremendously i i have gotten behind a few times and so i fired derby but um (laughs) no i didn't but i did i told him i said derby i'm behind like i have a couple books to read to catch up and and he just encourages me and just the thought of knowing he's rooting for me i take a day and i catch back up and um and so when i started this year i was thinking okay this is how it's going to be i'm going to get out my bible and i'm going to have my highlighter with me because i want to be able to highlight my bible and i want um you know no noise around me so it has to be kind of a special place and so as the year was going uh it was easy for me to drop off because there was too much i was putting on my plate and so what I had to change my thinking again because the results, I wasn't getting the results I wanted. I was starting to get behind. And so uh, what I do now is I get up in the morning and I, as I listen to it, I'm not highlighting it. I'm trusting God to make whatever he wants to stick in my head, stick in my head to use later in life. I'm just going to trust him. I don't have to highlight everything, but I'm going to listen to him and and while i'm listening i'll do some push-ups i'll work out a little bit and so i've been able to stay on track now for about a month without getting behind and uh, so i'm very happy about that but if you're not happy with the results you have to change your thinking if you're not happy with results there has to be some new routines new way of thinking to start getting results we really want Um, in the very beginning god puts adam and eve in a garden and he wants them to take care of it. Their job is to to keep it, right? Um, I love how some people describe your mind as a garden. Your mind is a garden. You can let weeds grow or you can let flowers grow, right? Your mind is a garden. Now, I have never gone outside of my house and thought, I don't remember planting weeds (laughs) because we don't plant weeds. They just show up. So there is no such thing as coasting and becoming like Jesus. There's no such thing as, you know what, I'm just going to kind of sit back, relax, and, and hopefully I'll just start to become like Jesus. You know, um, if we sit back and relax, weeds grow. We don't start looking more like Jesus. We, we start looking less and less like our creator. So we have to cultivate that garden. We have to cultivate our mind. We have to be figuring out that um, each of these thoughts, is this a good flower? Is this a weed? If it's a weed, i got to root it out. If it's a flower, keep it. But our mind is, can be very beautiful, a beautiful garden, or it can be ugly if we choose to let the weeds grow. And I love this idea of a garden being your mind because everything you see in this garden, from the grass, the bushes, the flowers, the trees, the bigger trees, everything you see above the surface that can represent character and actions and behaviors okay but every one of these characters behaviors actions started with a seed all of our character all of our actions and behaviors started with a seed of thought now you might have thought something uh, you might think something today and you don't see the fruit of it or it grow until months or years from now but seeds are being planted all the time I love this picture of, uh, you know, um, the seed grows and it becomes an action. Our thoughts are seeds. 
and we want the right ones to grow. We don't want the weeds to grow. So we got to check the seeds, and as they start to grow, we got to de- determine, is this a weed or is this um, a flower? All right, so our main text today is in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And in chapter 24, 1 Samuel chapter 24, David has the opportunity to get revenge uh, with a guy who's been trying to kill him. He has this moment where he could kill King Saul, but he refrains. And so there's this moment where it's like, wow, David, you are amazing. You have character. That's, that's inspirational. And then in chapter 26, David is in the same situation where he could kill the guy who's been trying to kill him, but he refrains. And again, chapter 26 is inspirational. Like, wow, David, that is incredible. You have self-control. That's one way of looking at chapter 24 and 26. Another way is getting a little discouraged because you're like, wow, David, I could never be like you. Like, you don't get revenge when you could. Okay, and that's why chapter 15 is encouraging because in chap- chapter 15, chapter 25 is encouraging because David has a blunder. David gets angry and wants to take revenge. And I'm just, I'm just glad not to be like, ah, you sinned. I'm glad to know that good people like David can have their bad days and make mistakes. Amen? Amen. And so in chapter 25, we read about David, where he has 600 men with him, and they've been hiding out from King Saul, who wants to kill David. And um, during the shearing time of shearing sheep, it was a festive time, a celebrate, celebrating time, because if you had a lot of sheep, you were going to make a lot of money with all that wool. And David and his 600 men had actually protected some flocks. And so David says, hey, you 10 guys, 10 young men, I want you to go to the owner of these flocks named Nabal. And I'd like you to tell him what we did for him and ask him if he would be gracious towards us in return. So the 10 men go to a guy named Nabal. And the Bible tells us right off the bat that this guy was cruel and foolish. And these 10 young men come to Nabal and say, hey, um, the whole time we were around your flocks, we protected them because it was in that day, it was common for thieves to come in and take some of your flock. Um, but nothing was taken from Naaman's flock. Um, and so the ten young men say, so we've been gracious to you and helped you out. Could you scratch our backs? Could you help us out during this festive time? Nabal turns to these ten young men and says, who's David? You know, there's a lot of slaves running away from their masters. I'm not going to give you anything. I don't know who this David is. And he talks cruel to them. And so the 10 young men come back to David and they tell David what happened. And David, um, the scripture doesn't tell us what thought he has, but we can pretty much read between the lines and know what his thought that came into his mind was because the Bible tells us that he tells, he, he tells 400 of his men <clears throat> to get your swords. So that means that there was a thought that came into David's mind as he's chewing on and eating the words of Nabal. The thought that comes into mind is, hey, you could kill him. You could cut off his future by killing him and all his servants and any descendants he has. You could do that. And you know what David does? He grabs that thought, that seed, and he plants it immediately. He says, yeah, I could kill him and I will. 400 guys, come with me. Get your swords. You're going to need them. Follow me. So David is going to take vengeance. He's going to get even. He's going to settle the score. And in the meantime, while he's planning that, one of the servants who overheard the 10 young men telling uh, Nabal what they would like, one of those servants recognized those 10 young men, recognized who they belonged to, and uh, knew that there was going to be trouble. And so the scripture doesn't tell us what this servant's thought was, but we can gather because he goes to Abigail for help. So the thought that came into his mind was, okay, Nabal, my master, is so foolish and won't listen to me, but his wife, who the scripture tells us she was wise, she was discerning, she was beautiful, 
Maybe she can fix what Nabal has uh, caused. And so a servant goes to Abigail and tells Abigail everything. And Abigail hears it and immediately goes into, all right, okay, this is what we're going to do. Grab a whole bunch of food and goodies, and we're going to go meet David. And so they're on their way. They're, get, Abigail is coming with her servants. David's coming with his 400 men with swords. And then they meet up before David can get to Nabal. He meets Abigail. And Abigail's first words to him are, everything is my fault. Let everything that's happened be on my head. I am so sorry, David. My, my husband, you know, his name means foolish and he acts foolish, okay? Um, <laughs> typical husband, okay. Um, I did not say that, I was repeating, Dale. Um, where was I now? I don't even know where I was. Okay, so, oh yeah, she's, so she's gracious, and she's saying, please, like, here, and, and she gives him all those gifts, and she says, um, while he was on his way to take away the future of Nabal, she was on, she tells him, now remember your future, and she mentions more than once his God and the future God has for David. You're going to have a kingdom. God's going to bless you. And God is going to avenge you with your enemies. And so while he's trying to take away someone's future, she's trying to get him back on track, thinking about his future through the lens of God. And so David comes with his 400 men looking to kill because he was eating the words of Nabal and taking them to heart and, and letting uh, the wrong thoughts take root. But then he starts chewing on Abigail's grace and mercy and kindness and thoughtfulness and he has a change of heart. He says, you are right. And he starts praising God because he knows Abigail is literally a godsend. And he says, he, he starts rejoicing because she just prevented him from uh, making a huge mistake. All right. So they both leave. Abigail goes back to her husband and tells him what had just happened. There was David coming with 400 men. They were going to kill you, kill us everything, um, but don't worry, I gave him food, I apologize, and, and, and at this point, Nabal, if he was wise, should say, wow, I made a mistake, I shouldn't have treated them like that, they were kind to us, I should have been kind back, and what a beautiful wife I have, you are so precious, thank you so much for doing that for me, um, you're, you're amazing, but instead, he's foolish and cruel, and Instead of praising his wife, the scripture says his heart turned to stone. A lot of commentaries uh, say um, he might have had a stroke. Okay. Now, I think it's interesting. His heart turns to stone, and ten, year, uh, 10 days later, he dies. But his heart turning to stone in that moment was not the first time his heart turned to stone. He might have had a stroke in that moment, okay? But before that, he had a character that was cruel and mean and foolish. And you get character by allowing those thoughts, cruel thoughts, mean thoughts, to stay and think about them over and over. So he had been developing a terrible garden in his mind. The truth is he had had a hard heart long before God said, this is what your heart looks like. He had been developing that. And so 10 days later he dies Word gets to David, and David starts rejoicing. Not that his enemy is dead, but he's rejoicing because he, he just a few days earlier almost killed him and killed a whole bunch of other people that were innocent. He was almost going to make a huge blunder. But thank goodness God sent Abigail, and he is rejoicing that he was prevented from that mistake. All right, and God... God's timing is always better than our timing. All right, now I want us to just think about a couple of things. Um, this Chinese proverb says, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your, your hair. You can't control the, the bad words that people call you and the bad things that people do to you. You can't control their actions and their thoughts. And the birds are going to be flying over your head all the time. Can't control that. But you have the choice 
through the power of Jesus to say, I don't have to hold on to that thought, though. I don't have to believe what they're telling me. I don't have to let them identify me. I know who I am in Christ. Um, can you imagine if, if every bird that, and every thought that came your way, you grabbed on and, and said, you have to live with me now? Can you imagine all the crazy thoughts you've thought and I've thought and, have, and saying, oh, you're, I know you're crazy, but you got to live with me? Um, Jeremy Kent, Ben's son, um, said this on Facebook this week. Many people don't know this, but it's possible to read something you don't agree with on the internet and simply move on with your life. It's like very wise. Um, because sometimes, you know, we can't control the birds that are flying over our heads when we go on social media. We can't control what people are saying. But we don't have to comment and retaliate and get vengeance. We can just move right on, keep scrolling, move on. Um, this is what it would look like if we had to capture every bird, every thought that comes our way. We just kind of look crazy after a while, like, um, everywhere we go. Now, this bird is so beautiful, and, and, and the lighting and, and the, doesn't do it justice. Its, its head is just like a fluorescent turquoise. Beautiful bird. This represents the beautiful thoughts that we can have in Christ. The beautiful thoughts of how we are grateful to our Lord, how we're grateful to the people in our lives. Beautiful thoughts. Oh, I want to do this for someone. I'm going to do this for someone. I'm going to, I'm going to send them a card. I'm going to love on them. Beautiful thoughts. Okay? We have the choice to take those birds and live with those birds and have those birds in our garden. Okay? Or we can have ugly thoughts. Okay? We can let those birds in our garden. The thing is, if we let too many of those in, no one wants to come to our garden. No one wants a piece of our mind because our mind, our garden, has become extremely ugly, okay? Um, if you ever meet someone who is cruel and mean and foolish, it's because they've acquired the wrong birds, all right? Now, since we're talking about birds flying over heads and being, and being um, you know, thoughts, what do you call an angry thought? An angry bird, right? Okay, um, Right. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the scripture tells us that God looks at the heart. Okay. God, why do you look at the heart? Why, why aren't you looking on the outside like people do? People make so many judgments by just looking on the outside. Oh, I can tell who this person is just by looking on the outside. I, I know their character. And God says, don't look at the outside if you're looking to find out who the person really is. The reason why God looks at the heart is because that's where you are. The reason why we need to care about what we're thinking about and the reason why we need to really cultivate our minds and, and, and make them beautiful gardens is because that's where God's eye is constantly. He's always looking in our garden. And he told Adam and Eve, keep the garden. Keep it beautiful. Cultivate it. Because his eye is always on the garden. He's always looking at our hearts. Judy, earlier this week, also posted this on Facebook. It says, when someone asks you what's wrong, but nothing's wrong, that's just how your face looks. <laughs> okay. Praise the Lord that God looks at our heart and not what we look like some days. Amen? Because some days we don't look good. Um, and, and thank goodness he looks at the, 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 you know, the whole of us. It's multiple, multiple thoughts adding up. Not just one bad day, not just one bad act, not just one bad thought. And then he judges us by that one thing. He looks at our whole character. And he, he looks at our heart. Now, birds can represent thoughts. And another one is food. You've heard of food for thought right? Well, thoughts are food, all right? And if we eat the right food, the right thoughts, we're strong, we're nourished. If we eat the wrong thoughts, um, it can feel like food poisoning. It can be terrible for us, and we don't grow. And that's why the, today's sermon is called, What's for Dinner? Because it's the idea of, what are you eating? What thoughts are you eating? What's for dinner? 
my boys, uh, they, at first when they tried tangerines, they thought they didn't like tangerines because they tried to eat tangerines like they were apples. They didn't peel it. They just bite right into it with the peel still on it. And so they thought, we don't like it. You know, we want something else. We want different results. Um, Melissa had to show them, you peel it and then eat it. They like it now. They got different results because they had to do something different, right? Um, if we want different results, the, the bottom line is we have to eat different. We have to eat different thoughts, okay? If we keep doing the same thoughts over and over, we're going to produce the same results. But if we start eating different thoughts, we start getting different results. Um, this is a phrase that I've been replaying. It's like my mantra lately for the last three weeks um, when I get up throughout the day. I just keep telling myself, if I want different results, I have to do different things. And then I'm like, okay, I want different results. Okay, I got to do different things. Uh, I got to work out differently. I got to study differently. I got to try th different things if I want different results. Uh, Alcohol Anonymous has a, a saying, and, and it goes like this. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Like, well, that is good. That's common sense, but yet we need to remind ourselves of that. If nothing changes, nothing changes. If I want different results, I've got to do different things. All right, and the scriptures, the Bible tells us what things God wants us to put in our gardens, in our minds. Whatever is true, put that in your garden. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, or praiseworthy, think, put that in your garden. Think about such things. And so, as we, as we think about, you know, where the rubber hits the road, how do we apply this? We have to eat intentionally. Just like our gardens, you don't have to go out and plant weeds for weeds to grow up. You can just wait and you'll see weeds start sprouting up. We need, there's a whole bunch of, of, of things that are going to come our way during every single week that's out of our control. The birds are flying over our heads out of our control. But we need to deliberately and intentionally put in our week the spiritual, beautiful food that, that we need to eat. Okay? Um, being very intentional, putting in, okay, I'm going to study this book in scriptures, or I'm going to buy a book and I'm going to study it so I can develop my relationship with the Lord more. Um, but being very intentional, because there's a whole bunch of things out of your control, focus on what is in your control. You know, just like we, we already have some plans today, what we're going to eat, right? Um, you guys coming here today to church is you intentionally putting spiritual food in your schedule. It's something you already are doing right now, and, and you have been doing. By going to church, that's putting spiritual food in your week. Um, but we can be even more intentional and add more things throughout our day so that we're developing and growing. Um, when a gymnast, when that guy starts his run, he starts with how he's going to land in his mind, how he's going to dismount off that vault, right? How crazy would it be if, if you got right here and you're like, wait a minute, how am I going to, I forgot, what, how am I going to land I didn't think this through. Like, that would be a very terrifying place to be right there, right? You already know there's seven days in a week. You already know what, uh, what goes on during the week that, that is consistent. Now start thinking, what can I deliberately, intentionally start putting into my week where I know I'm going to be fed some beautiful things, some pure things, some spiritual food that's going to help me with my relationship with Jesus, yeah. right? The scripture tells us to keep our zeal alive, we have to be very intentional. There's no such thing as becoming like Jesus on autopilot. There's no way you can become like Jesus on autopilot. We have to intentionally welcome him into our lives and plan it. John chapter 6, verse 57, Jesus said, Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. <coughs> Jesus says, eat differently. Feed on me. Put me in your daily uh, nutrition, okay? Put me into your life. Feed on me and you will get different results. All right, how do we do this practically? All right, um, 
All right, so I have plan- I've printed out some, uh, a list of 10 books that have helped me in my walk with Jesus. They're Jesus-centered books. They're helpful. Um, so if anyone is interested in this, um, I'll be in the back and um, gladly give it to you. On the back side are quotes that inspired me to take action. So hopefully it will just inspire you to take action, to be very intentional with your walk with Jesus. Um, and then um, all the books that I recommend, except for one because someone is borrowing it, Judy, um, <laughs> Uh, all the books that I'm recommending are here. Please do not take them, okay? I just want you to be able to look at them because um, some of the books are harder to understand and some of them are easier. And I want you to, if you are, to go home and, and purchase one and make an investment into your own spiritual life, which I highly recommend. Some people, they're like, oh, I don't know if I can afford it. Yes, you can. You're worth it. You need to invest in your spiritual life. I love books and investing in my spiritual life. It is important, so please do. And if you can't buy it, please come to me, and, and, and I'm going to try to fix that, okay? Um, your spiritual life is important. So um, if you are interested in any of the books, you want to look at them before you like, order them on Amazon or something, um, I have those, and they'll be in the back with the pages I'm handing out. All right. Now, if anyone wants to be baptized, today is a good day because um, good men and women have been fixing our baptistry, and it is now working. Thanks to Marvin, Kathy, Charlie, Pam, I think Ben was in here, and and anyone else I missed that helped out, thank you so much for that. (laughs) And if anyone does want to become a follower of Jesus and And baptism is submerging your life into his. And you know what Jesus wants to do? He wants to help you with your garden. He wants to take out the weeds. He wants you to cultivate a beautiful garden in your mind. And and he wants you, at the end of the journey, to look like him, which is the most beautiful person you could ever look like.